Hello and welcome to a fresh new episode of Legal Wrangle. We have selected four major decisions delivered by courts and regulatory authorities from the basket of recent developments in the field of corporate laws. From this episode onwards in Legal Wrangle, we'll not only discuss what happened in the reported cases, but also bring you the insight of legal experts to understand the future impact of the cases. Monsanto has recently been in news for contentious reasons. Today we start this episode with an interesting CCI decision where the key issue is the vicarious liability of the directors of company under the Competition Act. The bone of contention remains whether the commission has to first establish contravention under the act by the company and only then refer the matter to DG to investigate whether the officers in charge of and responsible for the conduct of business of the company. In February this year, the commission had ordered DG investigation into the role of officials of Maiko Monsanto Biotech India Limited. This was challenged by Monsanto on the ground that investigation into the affairs of the persons in charge cannot begin unless the investigation into the affairs of the company is not concluded and established. The Commission rejected this contention and held that it is nowhere stated that in cases of commission of an offence by a company, the prosecution has to be in two stages. That is first against the company and thereafter in case the company is held guilty against the officer in charge of and responsible for conduct of business of the company. It was clarified that Section 26.1 does not require investigation to be carried out in two stages. Let's hear it from competition lawyer Mr. Rahul Rai, Senior Associate AZB, what he has to say on this decision. This decision doesn't really change anything on ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it only reaffirms what the CCI has uh, been doing so far. Mm -hmm. and the way the process work is, works is that once the CCI decides to initiate an investigation, mm -hmm. uh, it directs the Director General to conduct an investigation. Now, in an investigation for anti-competitive conduct, the CCI obviously or the Director General obviously also has to uh, look at how that conduct came into place. So figure out the role of the individuals who facilitated that conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, without that inquiry, uh, the CCI's investigation into the conduct of the company mm -hmm. will not really be complete. So... Uh, all that this order does is that it reaffirms the practice that the CCI has been following. Mm -hmm. We bring another interesting case under the Competition Act. This case highlights the obstinacy of chemist druggist association who have, despite various orders passed by the Commission in similar cases in other parts of India, have not abstained from indulging in anti-competitive conduct. <laughs> The Competition Commission found the Karnataka Chemist and Druggist Association and Lupin Limited to be in contravention of the provisions of the Competition Act. In a case filed by Maruti and Company, it was brought to the notice of the Commission that KCDA restrains pharmaceutical companies from appointing new stockets in the state of Karnataka unless a no-objection certificate is obtained from it. It was alleged that Lupin refused to supply drugs to Maruti and company on account of not having obtained NOC from KCD. After DG investigation, the Commission has found that KCDA was indulging in the anti-competitive practice of mandating NOC prior to the appointment of a new stockist by pharmaceutical companies. Instead of desisting from such activity, these associations are mandating the NOC requirement either verbally in order to avoid any documentary evidence proof or under camouflaged congratulatory intimation letters with a view to hide their apparent anti-competitive behaviour. The Commission upheld substance over form and held it at Creative nomenclatures and terminologies will not absolve them of the legal consequences under the Competition Act. Interestingly, the Commission has also held that pharmaceutical companies committed a breach of their duty by not informing the Commission and becoming a party in implementing the NOC requirement. The arrangement was treated as an agreement under Section 2B of the Act. This decision is going to have a much uh, wider ramification, not just in terms of antitrust compliance, but mm -hmm. uh, the manner in which pharma companies conduct their business. 
and uh, of course uh, there is a certain concern in the industry that concern is largely around the actions of the trade associations of stockists and uh, right. uh, distributors uh, the commission has come to a realization that imposing a penalty on these trade associations uh, doesn't really have the right deterrent effect right so uh, in this decision they have gone a step further and they have said that look if you as a pharma company are asking for an noc mm -hmm. uh, which essentially is something that the stock uh, that the trade associations of stockists have been doing we will hold you as guilty as the trade association mm -hmm. uh, this this uh, would create a problem in the industry because uh, okay as a pharma company, you don't really uh, want to engage with every single person Correct. who knocks on your doors and says that give me supplies. <laughs> uh, and and this decision might just be concluded in a month that tomorrow anyone and everyone who sure. wants to uh, enter the business would go to a pharma company and say that look here is a CCI decision. I want supplies. Give me supplies. <laughs> so it's going to uh, this decision will have a much wider ramification. <laughs> The brand Toyota is known to everyone, isn't it? In the complex world of intellectual property laws, such well-known trademark can often lead to fierce litigations. Recently, the Delhi High Court settled this big-ticket litigation between Japanese giant Toyota and an Indian company revisiting the cross-border reputation jurisprudence in the field of trademark, which was discussed for the first time in Whirlpool versus Dongre case. The plaintiff manufactured automobiles and parts and marketed its products in different countries, including in India, under the trademark Toyota. The plaintiff's team designed a concept car with a hybrid engine for the 1995 Tokyo Motor Show. The vehicle was named as Prius, derived from the Latin word meaning prior or before. In 2009, the plaintiff came to know that defendants were trading in the name and style of Prius Auto Industries and even obtained trademark registrations for the mark Prius. The plaintiff sued for infringement, passing off and claim damages. The counsel for Toyota, Mr. Praveen Anand, argued and brought up the concept of well-known trademark and argued that defendant is causing erosion of reputation of Toyota. The Delhi High Court made an interesting observation that it is the date of adoption of trademark which decides whether such adoption is honest or dishonest. It was found that on the date of adoption of the trademark Prius, the brand already enjoyed a status of well-known mark and had a spillover reputation in India. The court noted that it is not possible that the defendant and plaintiff operated in the same industry and yet the defendants were totally unaware of the plaintiff's mark. What had basically happened in India was that, uh, you know, Toyota had not initially protected the mark in India. They had rolled out the car all over the world and the car was meeting, meet, uh, getting good success. Till Toyota discovered uh, at the time when they decided to protect it that there was an Indian entrepreneur who had got the registrations done for Prius. So, there was, this was a case where somebody already had registrations in India for a mark that Toyota wanted to use. So, the entire case was a case where a registered proprietor was sued by an unregistered proprietor on the ground of transborder reputation. So the interesting facets of the case were one that a registered proprietor was injuncted uh, initially by the single judge of the Delhi High Court and uh, thereafter the injunction was vacated and then it went up before the division bench and the division bench referred the matter for trial and thereafter another order of injunction was confirmed. So it was an interesting case where the registered proprietor in India was injuncted. The second element was that in assessing the basis of injunction, the court took cognizance of transborder reputation, which means they looked at what the reputation of Toyota and of Prius all over the world. And there were documents that were filed in the suit which showed the extent of use and promotion of Prius. But the court also went on the lines of a previous decision uh, that they had done in Mercedes-Benz, where the judge said that you are entitled to take cognizance of things which are in your own knowledge. So, for example, if a judge in Mercedes-Benz, just as Mahindra Narayan had done this, if a judge says that I am personally aware of Mercedes, then he doesn't need evidence to prove to him that the reputation exists. So, a whole lot of people had been reading about Prius and, you know, the entire world has been looking upon this car, etc. They are waiting, uh, they were waiting for the launch at that time, uh, you know, even in India, 
because of the auto expo, etc. And this was a clear example where they've, the nature of the evidence went into transborder and self cognizance of fact. And our last case of this episode comes straight from the capital market where the market regulator SEBI pulled up yet another financial intermediary for indulging in security scandal. The legal dispute dragged on until it was finally decided by the Supreme Court. Jet Airways Limited and Infrastructure Development Finance Company Limited had come out with IPO. SEBI found several serious irregularities were committed by the OP Stock Link Limited. The investigation revealed that OP Stock had cornered shares of the said companies which were originally meant for retail individual investors through hundreds of Benami DMAT account holders. The said shares were purchased through off-market transactions from 553 DMAT account holders who had been allotted shares of the said company. The said 553 DMAT account holders sold the shares to the OP Stock at a price much lower than the market value. The shares were thereafter sold at a higher price. The Supreme Court came heavily at the company and held that it clearly amounts to violation of SEBI regulations when an entity indulges in manipulative transactions of shares in an initial public offering directly affecting the interests of retail individual investors. The court elaborated that it is a clear case of capital market scandal where shares out of the quota meant for small investors in an IPO were transferred to fictitious DMAT account holders at a very low price only to be sold later at a higher price. And this brings us to the end of this episode of Legal Wrangle. Please write into us at editor at tioltube.com. For detailed analysis of these and more interesting cases laws on corporate matters, Please subscribe to tiolcorplaws.com. Thank you for watching.